Okay. Ah, uh, uh, hippo. Could you possibly my wrench? It's, it's a thing I need a, a wrench for. You know, gotta wrench it. Don't you mean spanner? He uses a spanner. <laughs> That the same thing. Come on then. Cough it up. No. Your video games. Your review. I ain't doing shit. <laughs> Ratchet and Clink. Here's another great platformer on the PS2, but with an emphasis on combat. Primarily ranged combat, although you can try taking out most enemies with your trusty wrench. Spanner? Spranch? Yes. Using a wide arsenal of creative and flashy space weaponry, you gun down aliens and robots across a myriad of planets in the Solana galaxy. And by you, I mean Ratchet, and by Ratchet, I don't mean Ratchet, I mean Ratchet, who wields a Spranch that doesn't actually appear to have Ratchet functionality, even though he uses it as a Ratchet in the beginning cutscene. You're accompanied by a tiny robot fellow by the name of B54296. Oops. I'll just call you for short. Let's talk about the weapons. The weapons in this game are very fun to use and cover any and every combat situation you can find yourself in. You've got the fast firing low damage blaster, the flamethrower, a grenade weapon but as a glove, the rocket launching devastator, and that's the end of the short list that I'm giving. But there are a bunch of cool creative weapons like the suck cannon that sucks in small enemies that you can then shoot as ammunition, the glove of doom which throws out tiny robotic minions that scuttle around and chomp enemies to death, and the morpho ray that turns enemies into harmless chickens. One of my favourite weapons from this game has to be the Visibomb Gun, which is a remote-controlled missile with a camera. You fire and then immediately switch to a first-person view from the missile's perspective and influence its trajectory using your controller. This is really fun to use because you get to explore the level from a new perspective and it's a good way to scout ahead to see if there's an ambush waiting. Because most enemies in this game don't spawn, at least you don't see them spawn. As far as you're aware, they're always there, waiting for you to get close enough before popping out from behind a building to launch death on towards your face. Every weapon in this game is useful in certain situations. The way the levels are designed, the way the enemies are designed, where they're placed and how they attack gives a chance for every weapon to be the best weapon to use. It encourages you to collect every weapon you can, not just because they're so diverse and fun to use, but because you'll need every single one of them in order to have the easiest time possible. Sure, you'll end up deciding on your favourites, and some you'll find come in handy more than others, but you never regret a purchase. There's always a place where you'll need it. Take for example those flying enemies I just showed. They're really difficult to fight because they're airborne, which means anything that doesn't shoot upwards is not useful, and they're usually placed in areas where you can't reach them on foot, so you can't exactly run up and whack them with your spranch. They're also able to see and shoot you from very long distances, meaning that you'd need to be dodging their bullets in order to get close enough to shoot them at a medium range with your blaster, tesla coil, bomb glove, or even to reach them with the taunter, which is a weapon that encourages enemies to run towards you. Their bullets hit very hard as well, so a decoy from your decoy glove isn't going to last very long, certainly not long enough for you to kill them with any medium range weapons. So you really want to be taking out these guys from a long range, and there's only two weapons that can hit them from such a range, the Devastator and the Visibomb Gun. The Devastator is essentially a sniper rifle and can lock onto enemies at a great distance and shoot them with it, and the Visibomb Gun is controlled manually. So that's the clear weapon choice for that enemy. The levels are even designed for that to be the preferred option. Whenever you encounter these guys, you're out in the open. They fly in from the side and start shooting. If you stand your ground it's going to be hard, but you always have the option of retreating a little and hiding behind cover. But now that the enemies have revealed their positions, they don't go back into hiding when you run away. They will stay hovering in place waiting for you to come out. But the level design gives you enough space so that after running backwards you can target these guys and shoot them down from a distance that they can't see you at. It gives you an option in how you approach the enemies. You could run and jump towards the guys and gun them down at close range if you're confident you can dodge their attacks, but if you're not as confident or just low on health, you can take the less risky, more time-consuming option. It really is amazing how well balanced the level and the weapon design has been in order to give you these options. And it's not like the Devastator and the Visibomb Gun are always the best gun to use just because they're super powerful. When you fire a Visibomb Gun, you completely lose control of Ratchet, but enemies can still attack you. And if they do, the Visibomb Gun explodes prematurely, so it's useless if you're not
not already in a safe position. The bomb also has difficulty turning corners, so you'll need to give any obstruction a wide berth, and more often than not, your first attempt will fail, because you didn't know when you had to start turning. And as for the Devastator, sure it's powerful, but the Mind Glove does the same amount of damage. If you're in close quarters, it's much easier to run in circles tossing around mines that home in on nearby enemies, than it is to line yourself up with the target and fire a Devastator missile. Sometimes there's just not enough time for that precision. And both the Visibomb gun and Devastator ammo is very expensive. Even if you have a ton of bolts, you still need to make every shot count, because you might run out of ammo. And if you run out of ammo on the smaller enemies, then by the time you come up to the enemies that can only safely be taken out with the Devastator and the Visibomb gun, you're shit out of luck. Basically, I'm just saying, all weapons have their advantages and disadvantages. The Pyrocitor is good for taking out large amounts of small enemies because of the damage cone. It's wide, and the ammo is cheap, but you run out fast, and the range isn't that great. The Suck Cannon has the advantage of free ammo, but the disadvantage of needing small enemies to suck up to become ammo. If there are no small enemies around, it's a useless. Now, I could talk about every single weapon in the game, listing their advantages and disadvantages, and I will. I already talked about the Pyrocitor, Devastator, Suck Cannon, and Visibomb Gun at length, so let's start it at the beginning. The Omni Wrench 8000 is Ratchet's trusty branch. In terms of combat, it's definitely effective, but swinging it leaves you open to attack. It's good for dealing with small enemies in small groups. Bigger enemies tend to take a lot of hits. You can also throw the wrench in a boomerang-like fashion by crouching and pressing square. This is mostly useless unless it's thrown at a bunch of small enemies walking to you in a straight line. It's very slow, and you're unable to move until the wrench is back in your hand, leaving you defenseless. Its obvious advantage is that it uses no ammo and can take out a lot of enemies fairly easily, but you've got to get up real close and personal in order to do it. The Bomb Glove is a decent decent damage weapon with a decent ammo capacity. It's good for destruction while advancing in a straight line towards an enemy. It's bad at targeting flying enemies and anything that isn't directly in front of you. The Bomb Glove is a weapon you start the game with, and you'd think as soon as you get the new weapons this would become obsolete. But like I said earlier, each weapon has situations where it is the best possible choice. The Bomb Glove is effective throughout the game against enemies below you and directly in front of you, and enemies that are grouped together. The Blaster has a fast fire rate and a fast projectile speed, which makes it useful for interrupting certain enemies at a distance. As long as you have them vaguely in your sights, the auto lock-on will aim the bullets towards the enemy, and upon impact will incapacitate them for half a second, allowing you to get closer, or to fire again. It's also good for taking out enemies that can't reach you, and enemies in medium range that are airborne. The Glove of Doom is similar to the Bomb Glove in that you throw a sphere in the direction you're facing onto the ground. Out of the sphere emerges four little robotic minions that crawl around in the immediate vicinity. They home in on enemies and attack them, causing lots of damage. It only takes about two Agents of Doom to kill most enemies. The Glove of Doom is useful for when you're being attacked from multiple angles and can't concentrate on all enemies at the same time. You drop the Doom bots to take care of whatever you're not able to concentrate on. The cons are that they can only reach enemies on the ground and will prioritize the enemy that's the closest, meaning that they could all gang up on one enemy, leaving you to deal with five or six. They also have a rather short range of detection and a small ammo capacity, which means throwing them too far away from the enemies and watching them amble around uselessly until they blow up is a big old waste of everything and is really annoying. The Mind Glove is again similar in that you throw mines onto the ground in front of you. They hover in the air and home in on enemies that come too close. Unlike the Glove of Doom, the mines don't move at all, so an enemy has to be much closer in order to activate it. To make up for this, the ammo capacity is much larger, so it's less frustrating to throw a mine too short or in the wrong direction. Unlike the Agents of Doom, however, the mines do not explode after a set amount of time. If you're able to lure an enemy into the path of the mines using the Taunter, then they'll end up not being a wasted shot. The Taunter is a device that requires no ammo and does no damage, but instead produces aggravating sounds that cause enemies to charge your position, providing they can hear it, essentially bringing them within range of your mines and other weapons. Of course, it's not always the best idea to have all enemies in the immediate vicinity flock to your current position, but on some levels you can use the Taunter to make enemies walk into a deadly force field, killing them. You idiots! You can also use the Taunter to increase the range of the mines from the Mine Glove. Gotta love that synergy. The Walloper is a melee weapon that lurches you forward with an electric punch. It's good for taking out ground enemies while charging forward, usually in one hit due to it being three times as powerful as your Spranch. And it's also good for quickly moving out of the way of incoming projectiles, since Ratchet is invincible for a few frames during the walloping. 
What this weapon is not good at dealing with is anything airborne and anything that likes running away, and in general is just less maneuverable. After you use any weapon, you have to wait a brief moment before you can perform another action. I'll call this the downtime of the weapon. The Walloper has a slightly longer downtime than the wrench, so if I get close enough to hit an enemy with the Walloper, I'd more likely just pull out the wrench and do some head smashes, because in the event that I miss, I'll be able to recover quicker and dodge away from incoming health reduction pellets known as bullets. The decoy glove is more of a gadget than a weapon. The the ball that you throw with this glove blows up into an inflatable ratchet and acts as a distraction, causing all enemies to turn their attention onto it. Even if they are looking right at you, they'll switch priority to killing the dummy. Now that's some impressive science, how do they do that? This weapon is really useful if you're in a sticky situation where enemies won't let you get your bearings. You drop a few down to keep them busy, walk away, turn around, and ready something like your bomb glove and then blow them all up. The only downside is that you can't have that many out at once, and they get destroyed rather quickly. You usually need to throw out three to buy yourself enough time, and that really chews through your ammo supply. The drone device is a ring of robot balls that fly around you and protect you from damage damage by exploding right in your face. You deploy them and then they stay until they run out of ammo, meaning that you can use it in conjunction with any other weapon or gadget. The low ammo capacity and low damage of this weapon keep it from being overpowered though. The Tesla Claw is a pretty powerful weapon that shoots electric. It doesn't require any precise aiming, you just sort of point it in the general direction of an enemy and it will hit them. It's pretty much Sith Lightning. It's effective at medium range and targets a single enemy at a time. You can fire the electric continuously like the Pyrocitor, so the ammo runs out quick. Then there's the Morpho Ray, which is a joke, but it still has its uses. It requires no ammo, and if you hold the beam on an enemy for long enough, they will turn into a chicken. The tougher the enemy is, the longer you need to hold the beam on them. It's pretty fun to use, but its drawback is that you need to be pretty close and the beam doesn't interrupt the enemy's attacks like any other weapon would, making it difficult to morph them before they can hit you. And finally, the Rhino, often touted as the best weapon because of its extreme power. The Rhino is essentially the eye win gun. It one shot wipes out everything in the nearby area and has an ammo capacity of 50 meaning you could easily clear an entire stage with it. The reason I don't consider this the best weapon in the game is because of the one factor that I've not yet mentioned when it comes to comparing the weapons, the price tag. The Rhino is available quite early on in the game in Blackwater City, but for an incredibly steep price, a price that would be impossible to attain at that point without hours of monotonous farming for bolts, the game's currency. And farming isn't fun. You get the majority of your bolts from smashing crates in various parts of the scenery, like lampposts. You get some bolts from enemies too, but the majority comes from the crates. The thing is, crates don't respawn if you die. There's essentially a finite amount of bolts on any given planet. So once you've got all the bolts from all the crates, you've got to go to another planet and break all the crates on that planet, and then go back and forth and it just takes so long. There is a glitch that you can perform that allows you to farm bolts from some instantly respawning crates, but it's out of the way and requires you to do some very specific things, so it's not like something you can do accidentally. And I suppose if you really want the Rhino early on in the game, then you should check the script before recording. And I suppose if you really want the Rhino early on, this is the way to do it, but it's not advisable, honestly, to get the Rhino this early, it, because it's essentially the I win gun. You get it and all the combat is rendered meaningless. You just go, pew, they'll get dead. Pew, dead again. No, you're not even to challenge, you know? It, re it makes the whole combat experience of the game boring and pointless and, you know, it's just all the other weapons become useless even though they're fun to use. You think, oh, well, it's not as powerful as the Rhino. I'll use the Rhino. I don't like it. The only time you'll probably have enough bolts to buy the Rhino is near the end of the game, providing you don't buy that many of the other weapons, giving you a choice between saving your money for some heavy firepower in the late game, at the cost of having a harder time dispatching certain enemies throughout the game, and having an easier time with enemies throughout the game, only to have less firepower near the end, when things start getting difficult. I personally prefer having access to all the other weapons and just skipping the Rhino, because I hate farming, and it's not really that crucial. You can complete the game fine without it, it's just sort of like a boost if you're having trouble. And I'm so great, I never never have any trouble ever. Okay, so that's all weapons. And how do you get them? You buy. You buy with cash money. Speaking of cash money... Yeah. You know, I just realized if I, if I can't put an annotation to anything there, I'll just be fingering that spot on the screen. So enjoy that.
in the future, if that is what happened. At the beginning of every planet, there's a Gadgetron vendor, where you can buy weapons and replenish ammo. Not all weapons are available for purchase from the start. You need to progress through the game in order to buy the more expensive weapons on other planets. What this means is as you progress through the game, the variety of ways to kill an enemy increases, and the level design changes to accommodate this with more variety in enemy placement and such. When you arrive on a new planet, you'll naturally go to check what the new weapon is at the vendor, and 9 times out of 10, you won't have enough bolts to buy it yet, even if you collected every single bolt from the previous planet. This may seem like an annoyance, but it's actually a good thing. If they just threw bolts at you all over the place all the time, so that you always had enough money when you got to the next planet to buy the new weapon, the whole idea of purchasing weapons would be pointless. You'd just have it. You'd always have it you may as well just be given the weapon as soon as you arrive on the new planet. It's all about the money management, making decisions about what to buy, whether to go for a new weapon, saving up for the Rhino, or even upgrading your health, which is expensive but really helpful in the long run. Then there's the optional gadgets you can purchase, like the Gadgetron PDA, which allows you to buy ammo wherever you are, which means you'll never run out of ammo as long as you have enough bolts. But buying ammo from the PDA is twice as expensive as buying it from a fixed vendor point. So you lose a lot of money, but you don't have to worry about ammo anymore. But if you don't buy the PDA, you just need to get better at conserving what ammo you do have, and it's like balancing your skill at the game, and the farming that you need to keep up with all the money that you're spending, and it's, whoa, it's good game design. And the best thing about all this is that you never think about it. You never feel like you're getting bogged down doing some goddamn bolt taxes. You're just playing the game, killing bad guys, smashing crates and collecting bolts, and making these money management decisions as they appear. It's just a fun. Well, that was long-winded and tedious. I didn't need to say any of that. I just could have made a sweeping statement. So to summarize, the weapons, good shit. And now, the platforming. As 3D platformers go, this is pretty slick. The camera is at a good angle most of the time, and pitfalls rarely feel cheap. There are a few sections where centering the camera is crucial in staying alive, like on the metallic windy roads, but for the most part, it's all good. That doesn't mean it's easy, though. There are plenty of frustrating sections, though the most difficult ones are reserved for the optional side paths that lead to certain gadgets and gold bolts. So if you really can't complete some of these sections, that's okay. You just suck. And by you, I mean me, because fuck this ice. It's not my friend. There's a lot of variety in the platforming too. You don't just jump and grab ledges. There's wall jumping and a helipack upgrade for Clank that allows you to make long jumps and high jumps and float down gracefully. And then there's a side grade in the form of the thruster pack which does the same stuff, only faster. There's also the swing shot, which is basically a grappling hook that handily locks onto the closest swing thing that Ratchet is facing. There are two types of swing things. The greens that pull you towards it, like the hook shot from Legend of Zelda, and the yellows where you swing back and forth from like every game where there's a rope. Swing shot segments are usually quite long, so it becomes fun seeing how quickly and skillfully you can complete them. There's a great feeling of momentum as you swing from thing to thing. Great fun. 10 out of 1. Then we have the grind boots that allow you to grind on metal winding girders? What are these things? Okay, they're like monorail tracks, but only sometimes? Why are the tracks all segmented? That's a health hazard. Anyway, grinding is also fun and fast-paced, but also more frustrating. To grind, you jump onto a grind rail and automatically equip the grind boots, and are locked into place. You have to jump to avoid obstacles that appear on the tracks, and in some grind rail segments, you need to jump sideways onto parallel rails to avoid undodgeable obstacles. The frustration of grinding comes mostly from the camera placement and the inconsistent grind speed. The camera is usually placed in such a way to give you a very short window to react to whatever obstacles are coming up. Sometimes it's incredibly short and feels like it would have been impossible to dodge on the first try. The problem is only amplified by the inconsistent speed of grinding. It attempts to stay mostly the same speed, but occasionally will speed up or slow down, throwing off any rhythm you might have had going. I mean, look at this. There are bombs on the line which can either be destroyed with the wrench or jumped over. Both actions require very specific timing in order to work. A fraction of a second early or late will get me hit, so I try hard to get the timing down, but due to the camera angle and the speed fluctuations, it's near impossible to keep it steady without trial and error. Or dumb luck. Fucking yeah. These speed fluctuations are not at all telegraphed beforehand, so I can only assume it's not an intentional mechanic. Aside from these minor issues though, grinding is still fun and looks pretty darn cool. 
Finally, we have the other weirdly twisted girders that don't appear to have any real reason for being there. You walk along these with the Magna Boots, boots with magnets in them. These sections are few and far between and really slow down the pace of the game, but not to a degree that makes it annoying. You see, most of these segments turn you upside down and it's kind of disorienting. You feel like you can't exactly frolic ahead with wild abandon like you used to, and that is literally the case because you are slower and cannot jump. You've got to be extra careful in these sections because one wrong foot can send you hurtling upwards to the floor, or more likely acid. It is a little glitchy at times, and getting the camera aligned perfectly straight is not easy, but it does create this sense of dread, and encourages you to be careful and methodical, which is a nice contrast to the rest of the game, but also reminds you that taking it slow can lead to better results. All in all, the platforming is excellent. There's plenty of fair challenge, there's plenty of variety, and there's plenty of beautifulness in the level. The, the Let's talk about the level design. Next topic. The levels in Ratchet & Clank are set on multiple planets in the galaxy and a couple of space stations, meaning anything goes in terms of environment. Snow, lava, toxic sludge, grey rocks, brown rocks, rocks that climb on kids. While the environments may change drastically, the design of the levels stays recognisable throughout the game and is overall beautiful in its simplicity. You have your ship at the landing pad and there's two or more ways to go right from the start. You pick your path and simply head through it, dealing with the obstacles as they come. It's a straight shot to the objective, and once you've completed that objective, you're given a quick and easy way back to your ship, either because the path loops back round to the start of the level, or by taking a teleport, or by taking the ever convenient taxi. The reason for this is to simply let you go down the path you didn't choose as soon as you're finished. There's no penalty for going down the wrong or inconvenient path first. It essentially eliminates the urge to backtrack just in case. You know when you're playing a game and there's multiple paths and you think, oh, I don't want to go down the one that leads to the next part of the game, I want to explore everything first, and then go to the next part of the game. Like sometimes you'll see something and you'll think that's obviously the right path and then that was supposed to be the hidden path and you found it, you know, easily by accident. You go down the other path, you go to the next part of the game, a cutscene happens, you can't go back. It sucks. That stuff that I just mentioned doesn't happen in this game. Not a little bit, not even a small midgen. You got path A, and after path A, you can instantly try path B. It's so simple and so convenient, especially when you consider that not every path will lead to something important. Some paths lead to gold bolts, others may lead to minor gadgets or NPCs that require payment before they'll help you. And you may not always have the money, and if there is an NPC that requires payment and you can't pay them right away, you don't need to replay that part of the level. If you took a taxi to get back to your ship, you can just take the same taxi back to the NPC. Same with teleporters. The way the level design gets you right back into the action never leaves you with the feeling that you've wasted your time. It's all designed to let you just play the damn game. No bullshit. The only reason you'd want to replay a certain path is to get more bolts, or to look for super secret hidden areas where gold bolts are located. And while we're on the subject of gold bolts, I should mention what they're used for. Gold bolts, as far as you know, are just secret collectibles that are there to reward extensive exploration and platforming. Some are very difficult to attain, but near the end of the game you find that they have a second, more substantial use. On Gemlik Moonbase at the end of the level after you defeat the boss, there's a tall structure near your ship. There's nothing particularly interesting about this structure, and for the for the longest time on my first playthrough, I never knew that it had an elevator at the bottom of it. The elevator takes you very high up to this secret room where you can upgrade some of your weapons into gold weapons by using some gold bolts and a bunch of normal bolts, increasing damage and giving some of them special effects, like the gold blaster bullets which bounce off scenery and do nothing. The reason I didn't talk about this earlier when I was talking about the weapons is because I'm a terrible script writer. You can also play as Clank at some points. In a few situations where there's no breathable atmosphere, Clank will be sent forth to explore alone. This really adds to Clank's character, because you get to see the world through his eyes. Everything's big and scary and goddamn. Look at these frog grublins. They were nothing to ratchet, but here, they'll eat you whole. Throughout the game, Clank acts basically as the catalyst for moving forward. Since Ratchet is just a mechanic who never once left his planet before now, he's not exactly sure what he's doing and why. Clank is there to tell him where to go. He's the exposition guy, if you will. And occasionally, a handy backpack. You get the feeling that he's just some companion robot, like Navi or something. But then you go up to this door on the Blarg space station, and it's like, whoa, what? Send Clank outside to explore the station? What? what's that? Oh, oh, I'm a tin can. I'm running. I'm jumping. Holy shit, giant frog. Squash him. Squash him. Can a matchbox? No, but a tin can. Look at his fist. It's a whole new world and it's a scary one. Uh, small enemies that were mere bitches before and now trembling before... You no, know, you're trembling before them. That's what it is. You're trembling before the small bitches. And 
they're fucking ruining everything for you. And you can't even kill them at a safe distance. You gotta punch them. You ever, ever tried punching a giant frog when you're not even a giant? Yeah. I thought so. Oh, look at these crates. You have to climb on them. This is adorable. I've been running around as Ratchet, smashing these things willy-nilly, and only now do I really understand that they are boxes and are probably big and heavy in real life, because Clank has to use them as platforms. Ooh. Ooh, look at him go! As fun as this section is, it runs the risk of becoming boring really easily. It's a nice novelty to play as Clank, but you sacrifice all the good game feel you have with Ratchet. Everything grinds to a halt because you can't fight good, and you move slow, and you can't jump high. But it doesn't become boring due to a neat mechanic they added to these sections to give them some real diversity. The Gadgetbots. These little guys are even littler than Clank, and you can communicate with them through coloured beeps and boops by pressing and holding triangle and selecting a direction. You've got wait, follow, attack, and enter. Wait and follow are pretty self-explanatory. Attack also. They run towards nearby enemies and bite them to death with fierce tenacity. They're actually very similar to the Glove of Doom robots, and enter orders them to enter a Gadgetbot gate or a Gadgetbot teleporter. You need a certain number of Gadgetbots to enter a gate before it opens, essentially making the Clank-only sections into puzzle sections. The Gadgetbots are activated a upon being broken out of these little glass pods, and if they die, they respawn at the same pod that they came from. So there's no chance at outright failure in these puzzles. The objective is to get the Gadgetbots from wherever you find them into the gate, so that you yourself can proceed. Sometimes you need them to clear the path of enemies that Clank can't fight, like this guy. Other times you need them to stand on switches for you to keep them activated while you do a thing. Other times you simply lead the bots around some treacherous terrain, making sure that they don't die on the way, or else you gotta run back and get them later. It's not so bad if you're careful and observe potential hazards before you reach them, and if you're really paranoid, you can tell the bots to wait while you go on ahead to check to see if it's all safe. Honestly, the worst part about these segments is the hazardous follow the leader bits, because the bots group up together, and on narrow platforms like this, they're liable to push each other off the edge, which is pretty infuriating, and it's completely out of your control. Thankfully, these bits aren't frequent. In fact, there are only two Gadgetbot sections in the whole game. There's a shit ton of sections in this game. I already talked about the combat, and the platforming, which is like two different big sections, but then there's like the, all the little miscellaneous things, like the hoverboarding, the puzzles, the, the clank segments, the, the giant clank segments, clank segments, which are completely different. All the different gadgets and all the little things they do, like they sort of m merge into the puzzles, kind of, and then there's the, the spaceship combat. Combat of space ships. Well, this game is just jam-packed with varied things. Well, speaking of Clank, what a contrast the giant Clank sections have. Similarly, there's only two of these in the game, and they're essentially Godzilla mode. You tower over normal enemies in helicopters and swat them out of the sky. You've got big chest bomb things that do massive damage, you've got missiles and shit, it's awesome. Unsurprisingly, the goal is to destroy other giant robots, because that would be the best thing to do. The movements are a little slow to emphasize how big you are, and it makes the punches feel really weighty. Wham, you know? The missiles also sort of home in on the enemies that you're facing, so it's not too fiddly. It's very satisfying. The hoverboard sequences are pretty fun. There are two in the game, again, but only one is required to beat, because the reward is a crucial gadget that you need to complete the game. You zoom along a track on a hoverboard against a bunch of nameless competitors. There are crates to smash through, speed up rings, speed up things, and in the second race there are missiles that you can pick up to permanently destroy the other racers. I would have thought that would have been cheating, but if you kill the guy in first place, then you become the first place guy. <laughs> I win. In general, though, hoverboarding is difficult and annoying due to the odd controls, turning seems to accelerate as you hold left or right. If you tap a direction, nothing seems to happen, but if you hold it for half a second, woo, off you go. And the other races are just too fast. If you miss a couple of the speed up rings or things, then you're going to lose because your default speed is much slower than theirs, which doesn't really make much sense. The hoverboard you acquire was owned by the current hoverboard champion, Skid McMarks. And if it's supposed to be really good because you can't even buy these, why are these guys so much better? Where do they get their boards? Completing the Blackwater City race gets you a Platinum Zoomerator, which allows you to do tricks during the races for a little extra boost, but I could never get the hang of this. You just sort of tap combinations of L and R buttons while holding directions, and if you land properly, you get a boost. But if you don't land properly, you crash. Honestly, the risk is not worth the reward. I, I usually fumble around with the controller trying to do a trick or two, and then I, and then if I manage to land, I, I'm in a weird crumbly crimbly position and then I fly off into the sea. Hoverboarding is one of the less enjoyable parts of the game. Gadgets are the doohickeys of the Ratchet and Clank universe. They 
do things. You got gadgets that help you around like the aforementioned swing shot and grind boots, and ones that get you through specific obstacles like the trespasser and the hollow guys. Shall we go through them one at a time just like we did with the weapons, with the great advantages and the disadvantages? Shall we do that children? Yes we shall! Yes we shall treasure! Hey! Hey! Shut up! We already talked about the grind boots, swing shot, hoverboard, platinum zoomerator, gadgetron PDA, helipack, thruster pack, and the magna boots, so let's start with the trespasser. The trespasser is used to open certain doors throughout the game. Walking up to the appropriate terminal will initiate a hacking minigame of sorts. You have to rotate the rings of lasers to activate the lights around the outside. There's no timer, so it's not really difficult. You just gotta mess around with it for a minute or so until it's solved. The trespasser puzzles are pretty good, if a little easy. The Hydro Displacer is another puzzle-based gadget that can only be used in specific areas. You use it to displace water by sucking it out of one of these water tubes, and then depositing the water into another tube somewhere else. It's basically a tool to raise and lower the water level to allow you to either swim up to a high ledge where it would otherwise be too high to reach by jumping, or to break blockages that would otherwise be underwater while the water is gone, because you can't fire a gun or swing your wrench while swimming. It's a very simple gadget, and the puzzles aren't really that tough to figure out. Most of the time, you just use it whenever you see the opportunity to do so, and the puzzle will be solved. But if you get it wrong, your only penalty is having to swim back and try it again. And since there are only two settings, with water and without water, it will only take two tries at most to complete it. The Sonic Summoner is a weird one. It's a helmet that you wear that allows you to temporarily recruit a sand mouse, which is a small critter that lives in a cylindrical house in the ground, and flies around in a saucer and shoots enemies for you. Quite weird, and mostly useless because it's temporary like the drone device, but has the added disadvantage of only being in a few select locations. In order to sonically summon the sand mouse, you have to wear the helmet and walk up to the mouse house, at which point he appears and shoots enemies for a while until he runs out of ammo. The thing that's really quite useless about this gadget is that the sand mouse isn't even that effective, and and usually isn't placed in an area where you'd need the help that he provides, coupled with the fact that the helmet itself looks stupid, and you've got yourself one of the least important gadgets in the entire game. The Persuader, on the other hand, is incredibly useful. It gives you discounts from Gadgetron vendors, and the discounts vary. Some weapons are straight up half price, others shave off a few thousand bolts, but either way, it's a must-have item. Though it doesn't discount the Rhino because that's sold by a guy in the back alleys. The metal detector detects metal, specifically bolts that are underground. You hold down circle and the metal detector will tell you how close you are to uncovering some via the pitch of the tone and the color of the waves. Yeah, sounds like a song name. It's good because you don't have to take it out all the time and check to see if there are bolts nearby. If you're in an area where you can find bolts, a little icon will appear at the top of the screen. So yeah, metal detector's good, no reason not to have it. The O2 mask lets you breathe oxygen. It's required for when you visit Orkson due to its poisonous atmosphere, and it also lets you breathe underwater, and in space. It's also got built-in, you don't even need to equip it technology, so there's no menu hassle frassle. I give it a 10 stars. The Bolt Grabber. These are becoming progressively more self-explanatory. The Bolt Grabber grabs bolts from further away, so you need to do less running. No downsides. Very simple. The map matic lets you see any secret hidden areas on the map highlighted in green. This is useful for late game when you're trying to collect gold bolts. Some of the gold bolts are very difficult to find without the map matic so it's certainly a good thing to get. The code bot, conversely, is not a good thing to get. I mean, it's not a bad thing, it's just I don't know why it exists. It is a gadget that opens exactly one door in the entire game. A door to a room that has bolts in it, and just one gold bolt. It seems like a bit of a waste of a gadget. Why not have a door open with any of the other already perfectly fine gadgets? Gadgets. It may as well have been a keycard. In fact, that's exactly what it is. Why is it a robot gadget? Why has it got a face? It leads you to believe that you can now open a ton of previously inaccessible areas. But no, just that one room. Maybe it had other uses, but they got cut for whatever reason. In any case, this is the worst gadget. The Hydro Pack is another add-on for Clank that helps you swim faster. It's really helpful, not only because of the speed, but because it makes turning bearable. Ratchet doesn't swim at a constant speed, he moves every time he strokes, like you would in real life. So turning was always difficult, but with the Hydro Pack you can turn easily, you can even do a complete 180 with ease. It makes swimming more enjoyable, and also allows you to access some secret areas. The Hollow Guys is a gadget that turns Ratchet into a robot. It completely changes the flow of the gameplay, slowing it to a crawl, because as a robot, you walk slowly, you cannot jump 
jump or use weapons or other gadgets and are generally completely helpless. The Hologuys fools robot guards into opening security gates and letting you through, gates that are otherwise unopenable. If the robot guards see Ratchet, they will run towards a big red button and sound the alarm, which releases these unavoidable orbs of death that will definitely kill you. So getting caught is not an option. These deception parts are some of the most tense moments in the game. Even with all the weapons, it's near impossible to kill the guards at a distance before they can press the button, dooming you. You need to get in real close and then take them out with your wrench, one by one, in order to stand a chance. Sometimes there's more than one guard, and you have to do a lot of waiting in order to take one out while the other isn't looking. Like the Clank segments, it gives you this feeling of being powerless, having to forego the usual blow everything up approach in favour of patient tactics. I mean, goddamn, this game is better at building tension in a stealth deception scenario than Assassin's Creed, because there's actually a penalty for being caught. The pilot's helmet lets you pilot fighter jets, as opposed to the transportation vessels you ride to go from planet to planet. There are only a few fighter jet sections in the game, and you can't play them again after you've completed them, which is a shame because they're great fun. You fly around in a big old place and have various objectives, usually just to shoot some things. You have a machine gun and a rocket launcher that has limited ammo. You shoot down smaller enemy ships to pick up health crates and ammo crates. These segments aren't very difficult, aside from the one boss battle you have while in the fighter jet, and it ends rather abruptly. I really wanted more. And I think that statement is indicative of Ratchet and Clank as a whole for me. There's a lot of weapons and gadgets and minigame-esque sections to this game that just... There's just so much stuff. On paper, a, a game like this probably, you know, it would fail, it would flop. It's just a lot of different things. They all work. They're all good. Some are better than others, of course. You can see all these different things, you're like... I don't know whether I care about that, really. Who cares about hoverboarding? Nobody. You've got too much quantity, and none of the, not enough of them are polished enough. They, they, you know, I would have liked to see more polish to the space combat, for instance. I would have liked to have seen a bit more of just more stuff to do in the Clank segments. Overall, it's a great game, and you should definitely have played it by now. If you don't have a PS2, well, get one. I mean, it's the best console, isn't it? Uh, but yeah, due to just a few little unpolished things like the Cobot and the hoverboard races and stuff like that, I'm gonna give it a number out of another number. And from me to you, I guess this is the end of the video. You may have noticed that I didn't talk about the story, characters, or cutscenes at all in this review, but there's a reason for that. I'll talk about it in a later video, where I'll be comparing the stories of the other games in the franchise. For now, I just wanted to outline the game mechanics of the first installment and why they work so well. If you liked this video, consider supporting me on Patreon, or throwing me a bone through PayPal. I also have a shirt if you would like to look like a twat. All proceeds go to me.